So I was asked a couple of months ago to give a talk in New York State about the history of wild turkey restoration in the northeastern states. Because New York State, a state played a big role in that wild turkey restoration history. So I put a PowerPoint together for the New York State uh, chapter uh, for their leadership workshop, and um, I was asked to present that today. But I've added a couple more slides to the end of it today to talk a little bit about wild turkey harvest management as well. Now most of you are familiar with the history of the wild turkey in the United States. Wild turkeys occupied 39 states and a few Canadian provinces back in the pre-colonial days. Uh, they range from southwest to the Atlantic seaboard and from the uh, upper Midwest in New England south to Florida, including one or two Canadian provinces. 10 to 12 million wild turkeys were, were estimated to have been in the, what's today the United States when the first Europeans set foot on this continent. This is a map of the pre-colonial distribution of wild turkeys in the United States. And you can see that range from Ontario south to Florida, from southern Maine all the way out to the, to the southwestern states, also in Mexico as well. It didn't take us, the European settlers, too long to change that. Our land use policies and the fact that there were no rules resulted in, in an outlook for wild turkeys by the time the 1900s rolled around that did not look too rosy. By 1930, the outlook for the future of wild turkeys as a game species was bleak. In fact, if you ask wildlife biologists back then, what do you think about wild turkeys? Will they, uh, will they be hunted in the future? The answer was a resounding no. They were on their way out. The birds were gone from 15 of the 39 states where they originally occurred. And the reason for that was habitat loss and past over-exploitation. When, when you wanted turkey dinner back in the 16 and 1700s, you got it by any way that you could and with absolutely no thought about seasons, bag limits, time of year when you were doing it. In fact, uh, until actually recently, back in the 1940s in West Virginia, uh, some of the coal miners had what they called the frying size season. And that was when turkey poles were about two-thirds grown and nice and tender. And that was before there was a lot of law enforcement effort and conservation ethic development. But take a look at this photograph. You've probably seen that before in some other publication. That's the market hunting days when, when the turkeys were sold at, at the market and so were deer. There are some estimated dates when wild turkeys disappeared from various states. Now, I don't know who kept all these records. I don't know how accurate they are. But in Connecticut, that date was 1813, Indiana 1906, Massachusetts 1851, Michigan 1897, New York probably had the best one is uh, uh, on on Mount on Gobbler Mountain in 1844. A guy shot supposedly the last turkey. And I'm not sure how they knew it was the last one, but he said it was. New Jersey, that sometime between 1840 and 1850, they disappeared. Ohio, 1878. Wisconsin, 1881. So we're talking before the 20th century for most of that. In the pre-colonial days, we, we had lots of wild turkeys, but by, by 1930, their numbers were estimated to be only 200,000 nationwide. Less than a quarter of a million birds left. And in 1941, this map was generated uh, with a, the extent of wild turkey range. And you can see that there were some wild turkeys left in parts, parts of Pennsylvania, nothing up here through New England, for the, for the Mid-Atlantic region, or in the Midwest. They were all gone. By 1940, the only states in, in what we call the northeastern part of the country were, that had any wild turkeys were Maryland, Virginia, West Virginia, and Pennsylvania. In Pennsylvania, wild turkeys were nearly extirpated in the 1800s because of habitat destruction and market hunting but they held on in the Ridge and Valley section of central Pennsylvania in extensive woodlands. And that gave rise to a theory among wildlife biologists that the only place that wild turkeys could survive was where there was 15,000 or more acres of wild habitat. 15,000 acres minimum. Wild turkeys have showed us that we didn't know everything about them. This is, kind of, this is a map of 1930 wild turkey range in Pennsylvania. And it looks fairly extensive. It covers a whole bunch of counties. 
But I'm going to tell you, there were only 800 to 1,000 wild turkeys living in that, all that range at the time. Pennsylvania closed their spring season in 1873. No more spring hunting, guys, in 1873. They didn't open it again until 1968. And that was done to protect hens and hopefully allow the turkey population to grow. In the meantime, Pennsylvania stocked thousands and thousands of game farm wild turkeys, birds raised in captivity, five to 6,000 birds a year from the 1930s until 1980, 50 years of that stock. Now, if that worked, what you would have seen is little, little outbursts of wild turkeys all across the map instead of what we did see, and that was wild turkeys extending their range through natural dispersal and as forests matured through the north central part of the state. So what we learned from that is game farm turkeys, turkeys raised in captivity, just can't cut it. Over a 25 year period, we saw only, only partial recovery, but by 1970, we realized the game farms weren't working. Unfortunately, they were still open until 1980. Aggressive trap and transfer programs began to develop, mostly in the southeast and in Midwest, places like Missouri, uh, when techniques were developed to actually trap wild turkeys. And that increased the speed of population recoveries throughout the southeast and throughout the, the uh, mid, 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 mid western part of the country. And it began to allow reintroductions into other areas and introduction of wild turkeys beyond their ancestral range in the western states like Wyoming, Montana, the Pacific Northwest, etc. But those techniques weren't really developed until the 1940s and 1950s. And the biggest innovation that occurred at that time was by two gentlemen by the name of Dill and Thornsbury who liked to play with explosives. They developed the, the cannon projected net and that cannon net and later the rocket net played the biggest role in wild turkey restoration. And these three gobblers are about to get caught. They don't know that, but they are feeding within two feet of a folded up rocket net. Now forest regeneration brought natural expansion of wild turkey populations in Pennsylvania and trap and transfer was initiated in that state in the 1970s. Now I want you to take a quick look at this uh, the person in in uh, this photograph right here is in this room right now he's working on a uh, on a project in south central pennsylvania he's working for the game commission doug little and um, so we were able to lure him away from that when i worked for nwtf and make him an nwtf regional biologist and it was a good move for both him and us in 1985 the occupied wild turkey range in Pennsylvania looked like this. Almost the whole state was occupied, and by the late 1990s, this area was occupied as well, at least what wasn't urban sprawl. Restoration was completed in Pennsylvania in 2003. In the process, they transferred 2,800 wild turkeys to 39 counties throughout the state, and that's what it took. It took dedicated work by a bunch of conservation officers and biologists to make this happen, no matter where it occurred. They also sent 915 wild turkeys to other states around the country. New York became a player in the late 1940s uh, when habitat began to develop in the southern tier along the northern Pennsylvania border. Forests were regenerated and turkey habitat improved. Around 1948, nobody has an exact date, wild turkeys dispersed into New York State from Pennsylvania. Now I have some information that there was a little bit of baiting involved in that, in that dispersal, but I don't know that for sure. At any rate, they occurred, they were found in, out in Cattaraugus and Allegheny counties in southwestern New York. And word of that, of that wild turkey presence spread and people began to be interested in it. So in 1952, a pheasant farm in Shenango County was converted to raise turkeys a mistake by the agency, but they found that out, that out later. But by 1960, they had released over 3,200 game farm turkeys. But in the process, there were some folks developing the techniques to capture wild turkeys in New York and move them around. By 1966, uh, you can see that the range of the wild turkey had expanded. It's a little bit more solid than it did back in 1941. And that will continue to happen throughout the 60s, 70s, and on into the early 2000s. 
Uh, New York Department of Environmental Conservation developed the trap and transfer operations pretty early. They, tra they live trapped their first turkeys in 1959. Nobody else was doing that in the Northeast at that time, or even in the Midwest, or upper Midwest. Uh, they moved 11 wild turkeys. It wasn't a big operation at first. From, it went from Allegheny State Park to another area of Cattaraugus County. And between 1959 and 1962, they moved 54 birds within that county to new areas to help them spread out. Then, between 1959 and 2000, 1,377 wild turkeys were captured and transferred inside of New York so that the whole state became occupied by the birds. In the process, 207 game farm progeny, the offspring of game farm turkeys living in the wild, were also transferred with very limited success. New York also contributed 758 wild trapped turkeys to other states and provinces. Uh, they, they total trapped uh, 2,135 birds, most of which came out of Allegheny State Park in the southwestern part of the state. I ran into a gentleman out there in Allegheny one time. Uh, I was hunting, actually, and I put a gobbler to bed, so I was out there early the next morning. His car pulled up, and he looked at me and said, you, you gonna hunt here? I said, well, yeah, that's why I'm standing here. I'm just going to walk into the woods. He said, well, he said, it ain't no point. Don't bother. I said, why is that? He said, well, DEC guys trapped all the turkeys out of here. They shipped them out to places like New Jersey, Connecticut, and all that. There ain't no turkeys left here. So I looked at him. I said, um, how come you're up so early? He didn't have an answer. Anyway, the wild turkeys, wild fat turkeys were released in 44 New York counties. They also sent wild turkeys to places like Connecticut, New Jersey, Delaware, Massachusetts, Minnesota, New Hampshire, uh, New Jersey, Ontario, Rhode Island, and Vermont. Without New York, the history of the wild turkey in the Northeast would not be as rich or as successful as it was. And most states experimented with game farm stock because at one point in time, before there were really good techniques to trap turkeys, it was the only game in town. There was nothing else you could do. Thousands upon thousands of game farm turkeys were released. But the development of those capture techniques really changed the game. Cannon and rocket projected nets were used. You can also use drug bait. You can use a couple other techniques. But for eastern wild turkeys, the best way to trap them is rocket nets or cannon nets. But one of the best parts about the history of wild turkey restoration in the Northeast is the willingness of state agencies and hunters to share the resource with their, with their fellow hunters. To allow wild turkeys to be taken out of New York or wherever they came from and to be placed in a new location, knowing that those birds weren't going to be hunted for a while, that, that is really, really, it's a testimony to sportsmanship and to the ethics of hunters. And NWTF also assisted with a lot of those trades by making reimbursements to states for the cost of trapping wild turkeys. We established a cost of $500 a bird. I'm here to tell you, after trapping a bunch of wild turkeys, $500 a bird is probably way on the low end. Because it takes a lot of time and energy to travel. In Massachusetts, uh, go back for a second. Yeah, Ma Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Vermont were the first northeastern states to get really serious about restoring wild turkeys. Early restoration attempts in Massachusetts involved, involved game farm birds. I want you to take a quick look at the at the headline on this article right here. Wapen area stocking of wild turkeys is locked. That's that's pretty much sums up what the game farm turkey uh, process did. I also wanted, to, wanted to, to take a look at this photograph. Here's these wild birds coming out of those boxes from the game farm. The guy's standing here and he's got probably a little bit of feed there. They're kind of walking around outside the boxes. When you let a wild trapped turkey see the daylight when you open the box, how many of y'all have ever been to a release of wild turkeys? Okay. They do not stay in the, they may stay in the box if they're facing in the wrong direction, but they fly out of that box and they disappear real quickly. Second attempt back in the 60 and 61 involved seven West Virginia birds, not enough, and some game farm origin birds from Nashon Island um, and, and from the game farm in Pennsylvania, and that was a flop as well. 
but the third restoration project used only wild trapped turkeys. New York agreed to assist. The, the birds were trapped in Allegheny State Park in New York State, and they were released in western Massachusetts in, Alle in Berkshire County. 37 birds were released between March of 72 and September of 73. They were released in Beartown State Forest. By the way, uh, two people I want to point out, well, one person I want to point out, actually two. This gentleman here is Jim Cardoza. Jim was a turkey biologist in Massachusetts for a long time. An unbelievably intelligent biologist, great man. And the man right here on the left is Fred Evans. Fred Evans is a master turkey trapper from New York State. Massachusetts um, Department, Division of Wildlife, uh, released birds at 26 sites in 10 counties. They moved 561 birds from 1979 to 1996. And as a result, there's not much empty space in New York. In fact, uh, we learned some things about wild turkeys after we released them and, and they made their way into places we didn't expect them to go. They will follow wooded corridors and stream corridors into towns and make themselves right at home in places that you would never expect to see a wild turkey. And they can get themselves in a little bit of trouble there. Vermont also played a major role in wild turkey restoration. Uh, they released hundreds of game farm birds without any success. But then they opened the fall season through 1968 to eliminate any survivors from that. And in 1969, they received 17 wild trapped turkeys from New York. Guess where? Allegheny State Park. In 1970, another 14 birds were received from New York. A total of six gobblers, two jakes, and 23 hens for a 31 bird total. In Vermont, they used rocket nets out of a box designed by Jerry Wunz from the Pennsylvania Game Commission. It's called a net box, and the net is folded up inside the box. Three rockets are placed on top of it. The birds are baited in, and then the rockets are rockets project the nets over, net over the feeding turkeys. This, uh, this net uh, takes about three quarters of a second to be projected. And then you can box the birds up and move them to new locations. And that is exactly what happened in Vermont uh, and resulted in in-state transfers between 1973 and 1986. They released birds at 15 locations. The average size of a release was 25 birds, which in general is a good, good number of birds, usually heavy on the hen side, maybe a half a dozen or so gobblers and the rest hens. Natural dispersal uh, re resulted in statewide population and distribution of about 75,000 birds. Pretty dang impressive with a start of 31 birds. In Vermont then contributed, they passed it on. They contributed greatly by, by shipping birds to Maine, to New Hampshire, to New Jersey, and to North Carolina. And they even made an attempt at introducing wild turkeys to Germany, which un unfortunately was unsuccessful uh, because the birds had to be held in quarantine for too long. New Hampshire, as I mentioned, was one of the early players here in the North, and especially in New England. They experimented with game farm stock. That's a story everybody had. But in 1960 and 61, they received wild trapped turkeys from, from West Virginia. Unfortunately, they didn't get enough of the birds to make a difference. And in 1969, they received 26 wild trapped turkeys from Allegheny State Park in New York. And then the population took off. We're hearing a little kind of repetitious thing about Allegheny State Park. It's a beautiful place. It's got quite a history. The agency in, here in New Hampshire transferred wild turkeys in state from 1973 to 1995. They captured and moved 314 birds to 15 locations. Now the man who is mostly responsible for that, had the support of the agency of course, is a gentleman by the name of Ted Walski. Ted was a turkey biologist here in, in New Hampshire, did a phenomenal job, has tremendous respect and, and admiration for the resource. And you know, in, in every one of these states, if it wasn't for a few individuals, the whole thing would have stalled. The people with the incentive to do it got it done. Connecticut is another success story. Uh, they released hundreds of game farm turkeys, but then finally in the winter of 74, 75, they got 17 hens and five gobblers out of Allegheny State Park in New York. It was a mild winter, the birds did well. 
And after that, between 1977 and 1992, they captured and moved 334 wild turkeys to 19 locations in state. They initiated a spring gobbler season in 1981 and a fall season in 1991. And Connecticut contrib contributed wild turkeys to Maine, North Carolina, and Texas as well. And you can see those release sites. The original release site was here in the Northwest. And then they released birds throughout the state. They've done best across the northern part of the state. And they've done pretty well in the southern part of the state as well. In fact, from up, up in this area here, had a complaint one time from a from a vineyard owner who said there were 1,200 wild turkeys in his vineyard eating his grapes and they ate 12,000 pounds of grapes. Well, he didn't say there were 1,200. He said in a week they ate 12,000 pounds of grapes. So I did the calculations, told them um, 1,200 wild turkeys in 200 acres of your vineyard. Can I hunt there? You know? Actually, we uh, we went and did some surveillance there, found out his big problem was deer, and. Uh, Asked him if he had anybody hunting. He said, yeah, I got a guy hunting here. I said, really, how many deer do you take? I think he got a buck last year. Anyway, 1,200 wild turkeys. Yeah, they weren't near that many. I have, I had a part in this history between, in, in New Jersey, uh, between 1945, 1970, 2,500 birds, wild turkeys were released, game farm wild turkeys. 250 were released at one site in 1960-61, and, and they, they just did so great that by 1975 there were 35 of them. And then the uh, uh, Sportsman's Federation in the southern part of the state attempted with some birds out of Florida uh, unsuccessfully. By 1975 there was no viable wild turkey population in the state. And I was in the right place at the right time. I was a turkey hunter, the only turkey hunter in the agency because I hunted turkeys in Pennsylvania. So they said, how would you like to get involved with wild turkey restoration? And I said, say no more, I'm your man. You know, the habitat looked great in New Jersey, but in 1961, there was a question on the, on the entry level biologist exam. It was, a, it was an essay exam. And you were to answer this question. Is it feasible to restore wild turkey populations in New Jersey? And if you answered, yes it is, you got it wrong. Yeah, thank goodness I didn't take that test. Stage two of the wild turkey restoration, we had Jerry Wunz from Pennsylvania come and take a look at our habitat. Uh, we initiated discussions with other states to obtain wild turkeys. And in the winter of 76, 77, it bore fruit. We got 16 hens out of Vermont. Now I've trapped wild turkeys for a long time and sometimes you just can't catch the ones you want to catch. And the guys in Vermont were having difficulty collecting catching gobblers. So we called New York and said, can you help us out? And sure enough, they came through with seven gobblers. And here's Fred Evans again from Allegheny State Park with a gobbler in New Jersey. He actually flew them to New Jersey. He had a pilot's license. And this is a, a younger version of me, 40 some years ago, applying a wing tag to a, to a gobbler before we released them. We live trap wild turkeys. Well, the first ones were, were released in 77, 78, or 77, and then the next winter, I trapped wild turkeys for the first time in New Jersey. Caught 24 birds, just for practice, didn't move any. We began in earnest two years later, in 1979. We captured and moved 29 birds. Now here's how we capture them. You lure, put, them, put the bait out, you wait for the birds to show up. Now there's two ways to deploy a rocket net. One is from the ground and the other is through that rocket net box. So we are using the, the net on the ground. You can see the net laying here in the snow. There's a rocket right here, a rocket right here, a rocket right here. How many of you have seen that kind of operation? All right, well these rockets weigh 12 pounds. There's about a half pound of artillery powder inside each of those rockets. You have to be there to set them off when the birds come. So you wait until they're uh, contentedly feeding and then you fire the rockets. It looks like you blew all the turkeys off the face of the earth. Behind that smoking debris, hopefully there were 56 birds in that flock. Hopefully there's about 25 of them under the net. This is what it looks like from the side. That net is deployed in, a, in three quarters of a second. You can see smoke trails from the rockets. This is a flock of gobblers. By the time the net hits the ground, they will be here. This guy here will be here. 
Now, if we're catching humans, it goes something like this. You just sat down to your favorite meal, lobster, steak, whatever it is, in a restaurant. Your back is to the door. The kitchen's in front of you. The door is 50 feet away. There's an explosion in the kitchen. How, and three quarters of a second is all you have to make it to the door. How many of y'all think you could make it? Well, we'd still be sitting at the table going, what was that? You know, the turkeys don't, they're reflexing. And if you've hunted them for any time, you know what I mean. Move your gun from here to here and you can forget it. The net flies over the turkeys, knocks them to the ground. Uh, they react very quickly, uh, but some of them are captured. We remove them from the net as quickly as we can. They do lose some feathers. In fact, one of my trap sites, a friend of mine who helped me out with uh, wild turkey work sometimes, was out scouting in the spring, early spring, late winter. And he said to me, Bob, I found this place. Uh, there's a lot of turkeys there, but I I'm going to name it Slaughter Hollow. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, there's turkey feathers everywhere. So, it was one of our capture sites. The New Jersey restoration is now complete. It was a two-man operation from 1978 to 1990, me and another guy. We had a larger crew, 2000, or 1992 to 2001. In that period of time, we captured and moved, captured 3,000 wild turkeys and moved them to 42 locations throughout the state. But in the process, we also, because we're having some struggles in the southern part of the state, what's the area known as the Pine Barrens, they didn't take off as quickly as I would like. So we obtained wild turkeys from Arkansas, Alabama, Georgia, and South Carolina to see if birds from pine woods and sandy soils would do any better. By the way, they did not. But, but we developed a new release technique and it worked out much better where we released birds two or three years in a row. And now that area, this area right here, First time opened at the spring season, they, they took 24 birds. After the supplemental release thing went into effect, they're now killing 300 gobblers in that county. So, it did work. Anyway, we also ship wild turkeys to Illinois, Delaware, Ontario, and New York. We had actually had to give New York back three turkeys one day. And the average spring harvest uh, today in New Jersey is about 3,000 birds. Another success story, Maine. Uh, the winter of 76, 77, 41 wild trap turkeys from Vermont. It got off to a slow start. I don't remember if any of you remember the 1977-78 uh, winter. It was unbelievable. So, New York, so Maine had to kind of step it up again later on. In 86, 87, they received 70 birds out of Connecticut. And then things really took off. Uh, that in the 80s and 90s, a few birds moved in state, mostly the southern part of the state. And then two, in the early 2000s, they began to move birds further north. They opened a spring season in 1986, a fall season in 2002. And Maine wild turkeys have trespassed into Canada and are now residing in New Brunswick. And there may be a huntable population in New Brunswick today, thanks to y'all from Maine. Maine Restoration is a, is a great, great history of people working together. A uh, gentleman by the name of Phil Bosenhard was, uh, was in charge of it for a long time. Brad Allen, you may know from, from the department. Rhode Island got into the mix in 1980 with 29 wild trap turkeys. Their progress was slow, uh, but they, they introduced 48 more in, in trapped in New York. And, and today they have a spring season and a fall season as well. Of course, you know, Rhode Island's a pretty small place. You can drive across it in about 20 minutes. Um, but they have a viable turkey population. So everybody in the Northeast now has a viable turkey population thanks to trap and transfer work that took place from the late 60s through the early 2000s. <clears throat> so between 1950 and 2000, wild turkeys re were restored to former range in all of these states and they were introduced to, to areas beyond their ancestral range in the West, and success was achieved using wild stock. In the 1980s, Ontario received wild trap turkeys from uh, New York, Iowa, Missouri, and uh, Michigan, and New Jersey. Quebec received wild trap turkeys from Ontario in 2000, in the early 2000s, and those birds moved into uh, um, more expanded into, into Quebec as well. The western provinces have populations established from our western states. 
So this map, these two, two maps will give you a comparison. 1980, the wild turkey restoration work looked really good, but there were a lot of holes. By 1999, many of those holes were filled in. By 2014, this is what it looked like. In, in 2009, the estimated population was about seven, no, close to seven million birds. But by 2014, it had declined a little bit. And that's something we're going to need to keep our eye on. 2009, the total population estimate nationwide was between 6.2 and 6.4 million. Today, it's estimated at between 6.0 and 6.2 million. Now, that doesn't sound like much, but biologists in various states are looking at their productivity of wild turkeys and what's happening to the habitat. You know, we're talking 30, 40 years since wild turkey restoration began. Habitat does not stay the same. So we're, we are going to have to not only save the hunt, but save the habitat to make sure that we can sustain a turkey population nationwide of 6 million or more. We need to do that. By far, eastern wild turkeys are the most abundant. Uh, Rio Grande's are second. And the Gould's turkey is the, is the uh, smallest, smallest of the subspecies population-wise uh, in the United States because of limited habitat in New Mexico and Arizona. One of these days, I'm gonna get to hunt them somewhere. Just a, a look at the harvest uh, from 2013. In the fall of 2013, 103,000 birds nationwide, but that's a 20% decrease. Probably more to do with people hunting deer and other things than it is to has to do with, with turkey populations going down. Spring is where you really have to watch because the spring season is a population parameter. Um, and 665,000 birds, almost 666,000 birds in the spring of 2014, about a two two and a half percent decrease. Combined, there's about a five and a half percent. Uh, decrease from 2009. The states with the highest harvest, Pennsylvania, Missouri, Georgia, Wisconsin, and Alabama uh, for the 2013-2014 the harvest. Hunter numbers, overall hunter numbers, 2 million hunters. When I tell this to non-hunters, you know we've got, we have about 6 million wild turkeys, we have 2 million hunters. They go, oh man, that, how can there be any wild turkeys? And then I tell them, well, all you got to do is try to hunt them. You'll know the answer to that question. Fall uh, increased about 10%, the fall take. And the total take was 2.6 million wild turkeys. 21st century turkey hunters, that is all of us, are riding the crest of a wave of, of restoration that was successful and introduction programs. State agencies, dedicated personnel, dedicated volunteers and NWTF made that happen and I think every one of us can be proud that we played a role in that and continue to play a role in that today. Hunters paid the freight as they have for conservation for over a century. You and I as hunters and anglers pay for conservation. 85% of the funding for wildlife agencies comes from us and that means we need to do our three stuff to make sure our numbers stay where they are. Now, turkey hunters, turkey hunters have come up with all kinds of questions. In fact, there's a column in Turkey Country Magazine called Ask Dr. Tom. Some of the questions that come into that are unbelievable. So here's one of the questions I get a lot. They're goblet. Why can't we hunt earlier in this? I heard of goblet in March. What are we doing hunting in May? Why can't we hunt all day in the spring? Why can't I take more turkeys? They're only letting me take one, or they're only letting me take two. Couldn't I take another one? And how come the fall season is so short? Well, that's where biologists make decisions. And they make decisions based on data, and they make decisions in the interest of the resource. The harvest strategies, there's three basic harvest strategies available to us as biologists. A spring gobbler only harvest. That's really the safest, safest thing to, to play. A spring harvest with a limited either sex fall harvest, that's a good deal because it provides more recreation than the spring only. The other alternative is to maximize the combined spring and fall harvest. The downside of that one is we have no control over annual recruitment, weather and things like that. So if you're maximizing the harvest, you can damage the population. 
So our concerns as biologists, number one, wild turkey recruitment, the number of young brought into the population every year, it varies significantly. It's heavily affected by weather. Both spring and fall harvest have been shown to be additive mortality. In other words, if you didn't shoot them in the spring or the fall, those birds would be alive, most of them, next year to reproduce. So hunting has an impact on populations, whether it's spring or fall. Not a significant impact in most cases, but an impact nonetheless. And then we also have a desire to provide the maximum amount of opportunity to you all, and to me, because I like to turn out too, with the least impact on the resource. And that's why most states, here in the Northeast especially, when they restored wild turkey populations, went to gobblers only. And then after a while, initiated the fall season. Now I love to hunt turkey. I will hunt, if it was legal, I would hunt turkeys 12 months out of the year. I think my wife can vouch for that. And, but it's not legal, and it's a good reason it's not legal. Now, as far as spring timing goes, why don't we open the season April 1st? Dang, you know, I went out on April 1st, they were gobbling their heads off. There were turkeys gobbling on every hillside. And then I went out the second week of the season and I didn't hear a dang thing because the season's too late. That's the usual uh, supposition. To play it safe, hens should be laying eggs and incubating when the season's open. Egg laying is largely controlled by photo period, the length of daylight. Breeding can occur as early as March 1st. I have seen hen turkeys get bred March 1st, but they don't lay an egg on March 2nd. Until the first ovum is released from the ovary, travels into the oviduct, no eggs are laid. And that is where the photo period comes in. In general, that occurs around mid-April when the daylight length gets that time. Now there's some variability among individual hens. When I put radio transmitters on hens, the earliest I ever had one start to incubate was April 1st. That was an anomaly. Most of them didn't start to incubate until May. By the way, she lost that nest and the next nest and the next nest. Active sperm from, from one breeding can remain increases in the oviduct of the hen for a month or more. So, she really doesn't need to visit the gobbler, but she kind of likes them, so she does go back occasionally. When an ovum enters the oviduct, fertilization occurs and the first egg begins to form. It takes about 24 hours for, for an egg to form. So as ova, ova are released, one egg is making it through the track, she lays it in the nest. Tomorrow she'll come back, she'll lay another egg in the nest. Now, again, spring season time, researchers down at Virginia Tech conducted a this is, this is science terms here, a range-wide meta-analysis of turkey nesting and spring season dates. In other words, they looked at all of our data. And they looked at data on gobbling activity. They looked at data on nest chronology and phenology. They looked at data on hatch dates. And what they found when they looked across the United States is that the majority of states opened their season too early when hens were just beginning to lay. You go to South Dakota, you can hunt turkeys in early April, second week of April, April 10th. Well, shoot, there's no egg laying going on on April 10th in, in South Dakota. But they do have an advantage. There's not that many hunters there. You look at a state like Pennsylvania where there's 240,000 spring hunters, you do not want to turn those guys loose April, April 10th. Based on gobbling activity, hatch dates, etc., that is what they found. And that's good, good information. But recently it's been backed up by, by research in Pennsylvania. And here's the decision-making process. We need to satisfy hunters, but we need to pre protect hens. Hunters love to, who, doesn't, who in this room doesn't like to hear gobble? I mean, that's why we do it, right? One reason. With an early opening in the spring season, there's potential for hen harvest, either illegal or accidental, and potential for nest abandonment because in the first few days when she's laying, if you bump her off the nest, she probably won't come back. So a conservative strategy is to open the season near the median date of incubation initiation. What I mean by that is when half of the hens have started to incubate. That's the median date. 
and that is also when the second peak in gobbling activity often occurs. And gobblers will still be responsive to calling. So are we using an accurate incubation dates or are we just like guessing? Well, Pennsylvania, uh, and I'm using Pennsylvania as an example, and most of the, the seasons in this part of the country are set pretty well. Uh, their season has opened the Saturday closest to May 1st since 1968. The median incubation date statewide estimated from data from 1953 to 1963 was May 4th. Okay, so that was, that was 50 years ago. Climate change and all that stuff. And climate change uh, was thought that it was thought that uh, could be altering the nesting phenology of wild turkeys, among other things. So in 1999-2000, uh, a study in South Central Pennsylvania showed a median date of, April, of May 11. That was only a two-year study, though. So does the median date of incubation initiation still coincide with the opening of, of the spring season in Pennsylvania? Well. Another study was initiated, but it wasn't to determine anything about nesting. It was to look at uh, the, the impact of fall hunting. But a side benefit from 2010 to 2014, each year 60 hens were equipped with satellite transmitters. There was an 80, they're 80 grams and they're uh, placed on the back of the bird, just like a backpack. What they found was, there's no difference among age classes or the study areas, north or south, except for 2014. The southern study area had a May 1st median date, the northern area a May 14th median date in 2014. But the rest of the years, the date that was most often seen as the median date of initiation was May 2nd. So the season opens at the right time. Then, then you hear this one. Oh shoot, it's all over by the second week. They quit gobbling. Our season is too late. We gotta jump it up. Now I want I want you to pay particular attention. This I, I pulled my trail camera cards last week. Take a look at the date, if you can see this date. June 6th. What are these guys doing? <laughs> oh, they're still chasing the hand. Here we are again. Unfortunately, the light was wrong or something. Oh, my buckwheat was up and it reflected light into the camera and messed up the, cam the picture. But June 13th, and they're still at it. The latest I have ever called a gobbler up was on the morning of June 15th. The reason I remember it is because my folks' anniversary was June 15th, and so it just kind of clicked in my head. So I called up a gobbler for a guy because he had never seen one called up on June 15th. I suspect the reason I've never called one up later than June 15th is because I haven't tried. So, when it comes to liberalizing seasons, here's some of the concerns we have. All day hunting or a larger bag could produce more illegal or accidentally, the accidental take to hens, especially early in the season when they're still up and moving around. And that goes for the all day hunting thing. Disturbance of nesting hens, again early in the season, and a larger spring harvest could impact the age structure of the population and subsequent hunt quality. So biologists need to monitor the, the age structure of the harvest, the adult juven, the juvenile adult ratio. A longer fall season could impact hen survival and future recruitment, and also gobbler survival and, and the future spring hunt quality. It's more additive mortality. So those are the things that we as biologists consider when we're setting seasons. Unfortunately, legislators do not consider those things. Uh, and that's why legislators should not be in the business of setting hunting seasons. Biologists prefer to be conservative, to assure the future of the resource and the quality of the hunt. That's what we're in business for. And I think by and large, when you look across what's happened with turkey hunting over the last 40 years, I think conservative and closely monitoring things is the way to go. This has been an amazing success story. I have had the privilege of working through that success story, uh, the privilege of, of having the kind of career that wildlife students in the universities dream about, and I thank God every day for that, because it was phenomenal. Uh, I hate to give it up, but um, I haven't given it up entirely, and got lots of family stuff. I've got 15 grandkids to teach how to hunt. So, 
My priorities have changed just a little bit. I just want to take a minute to thank all of you because I did that for money, not much money, I grant you, but for money. Uh, all of you do it simply because you love it. Now, I did it because I loved it too, or else I'd have had a job in a pharmaceutical outfit making probably three times as much money. But there is no career, I don't think, that, that could have been as, as rewarding as a career I had. Remember, NWTF, conserve, hunt, share. Save the habitat, save the hunt. Thanks for everything you do. Thanks for the time you spend. Thanks for the money you spend. Thanks for digging deep, both in your hearts and your wallets.